Hello and, Hello and welcome to Audi Service TV. Today we'll be looking at the 1.6 and 2-litre four-cylinder TDI engines as a modular diesel matrix, MDB. Let's welcome our expert, Wolfgang Mattes, from Audi Service Training. Hello, Thomas. To kick off, we first need to explain the term modular diesel matrix. So we have a base engine, and by changing the peripheral equipment, we can meet the various exhaust gas standards? That's correct. We have the base engine complete with cylinder block and cylinder head. By making changes to the peripheral equipment on this engine, we can meet various exhaust gas standards. The ultimate goal is to cut down on CO2 and to save fuel. The idea is to prepare the engine so that it can be used in the European market. The engine's exhaust gas concept is also intended to serve the American markets, NAR. By taking this approach, is it also possible to meet future exhaust gas regulations? Any regulations or standards that follow EU5 can be met using this engine. The SCR system with catalytic converter and AdBlue is the focus here. And with this system we can serve the relevant EU5 countries. That's already happening in other vehicle classes. Today we're talking about the EU5 standard. Does this mean that the EU4 is no longer significant? No, EU4 still applies in countries that have not yet enforced our more stringent exhaust gas standard. Other components are drawn on for engines to fulfill the EU4 standard. The EU5 standard has been in force in Europe since September 2009 and it's binding. We'll look at the EU6 standard in another program. Is there a self-study program already available on this topic? Yes, there is. Self-study program 608. This program looks at all aspects of the engine, including the EU6 standard. The EU6 comes into force from August 2014 and is binding for new models. What are the differences between the 1.6 and 2-litre engines? The main difference is the cylinder block. It has its own bore and its own stroke. In other words, it's not a slimmed-down 2-litre engine with a different crankshaft and shortened stroke. And of course, the other difference is the balance shafts, which the 1.6-litre engine does not have. Let's now take a look at the engine mechanics of the 2-litre TDI. We have a 1.6 and a 2-litre TDI engine here in the studio. The 2-litre has balance shafts, but the 1.6-litre doesn't. That's right. One balance shaft is located behind this cap on the 2-litre engine, and here on the other side is the second part of the balance shaft. So there are two balance shafts installed in the 2-litre engine. There are no balance shafts installed in this position on the 1.6-litre engine. You can see that the engine block housing has been modified as well. The same is true on the other side. The engine block has been streamlined, so the engine works without any balance shafts. That also has something to do with the frictional power. The graphic depicts both balance shafts. You can see the crankshaft drive above the gear module. You can also see a change in the rotational direction. This change means that two shafts rotate against the crankshaft. The anti-friction bearings are also depicted. Friction bearings are not used in this case. The entire assembly is lubricated by oil vapor from the engine block. This vapor is always available in sufficient quantity. The new oil vacuum pump is only new for this engine, isn't it? Yes, it is new for the four-cylinder engine. The oil vacuum pump is familiar from the six-cylinder TDI engine. It's regulated in a new way in the four-cylinder engine. In this case, a control piston has been added to the pump. The control valve regulating small and large oil pressure is also located outside the engine. You've brought an exploded diagram with you. Yes, you can see the oil vacuum pump, which is a volumetric flow-regulated pump. The right-hand part is the oil pump, and if you look across the top, you can see the black control piston. 
On the left, you can see the vacuum pump. Both pumps are installed in the oil chamber in the crankcase. Both engines can be installed transversely and longitudinally. The only thing that changes is the position of the oil filter module. Yes, the oil filter module is the main distinguishing feature. When installed transversely, the oil filter module is here at the bottom. The oil filter element with the module is down here. The module contains the oil cooler and the oil pressure switch, as well as the oil filter with the element. When installed longitudinally, the oil filter is here at the top, and the module is screwed on at the bottom. This is due to space reasons. When it comes to transverse installation, there is less space at the front. In the longitudinal position, there is space at the top. That's why you have a fixed oil filter for one and a suspended oil filter for the other. Again, we can demonstrate this using a graphic. On the left, you can see the oil filter module for longitudinal installation, and on the right, for transverse installation. The bolting points on the housing are the same. The only difference is that the oil filter element is fixed in one and suspended in the other. The cylinder head is also new. Here you can see a camshaft module fitted like the retaining frame previously. Both camshafts are located in this frame. It's only possible to replace the camshaft module as a complete unit. The cams and the camshafters piping are fixed camshafts. You can see the arrangement here. The shafts have been shrunk, which means that they're refrigerated. The cams, in contrast, are heated. The module is then pushed together. The cams are installed in the correct position in a machine, and the ice-cold tubes are then pushed through from the outside. Both elements are then brought up to the same temperature. Through this process, the cams are securely connected with the camshaft pipe, which is why the module can only be replaced as a complete unit. Could you tell us the history of the rotated valve system? Traditionally, there's been an intake camshaft on the intake side, and conversely, exhaust camshafts on the exhaust side. As the engine has been developed, this star formation of valves has been dropped from the conventional design. As a result, you get extended inlet ducts, swirl formation, etc. And you also don't have the conventional arrangement of intake-intake next to each other. Instead, you have the arrangement of intake-intake, exhaust-exhaust behind each other. The ducts are now behind one another. This setup generates a swirl effect. A valve seat swirl phase has been incorporated here. This means that the air is swirled through the long duct in the cylinder. The swirl phase intensifies this swirl. You can see the valves from below on the bottom right-hand side of the graphic. They have rotated. The exhaust duct is shown in red and the inlet duct in blue. You can see that the ducts are located behind one another. You can see it more clearly in the diagram at the top. It's clear how the two ducts move towards the valve with the rotational movement. The valve seat swirl phase also takes place in both valves. A swirl effect is generated in the cylinder. The intake side is highlighted in blue and the exhaust side in red. What are the benefits of this system? There are no longer the throttle valves on the intake manifold side. And the same goes for the control motor, the rod, and the controller from the control unit. Therefore, the benefit is that there are fewer components. And this was achieved purely by rotating the star of valves and the valve seat phase. Now let's turn our attention to exhaust gas recirculation. Thank you. 
In terms of the EU5 standard, what form does exhaust gas recirculation take? The exhaust gas flows via the exhaust manifold and turbocharger and enters the oxidation catalytic converter. In the right angle here, the exhaust gas flows down into the particulate filter in a steel housing. The particulate filter houses the exhaust gas recirculation cooler. The exhaust gases flow through this cooler via a hose system. The gases enter upstream of the turbocharger turbine. This is where the air from the air filter is added. The exhaust gases are directed here and mixed to optimum effect. The turbine mixes the gases and, pressurized by the charge system, the gases then enter the intake area. Here is the throttle valve for the intake module. The gases then flow via the charge air cooler. This is the first time that the cooler has been integrated in a diesel engine, in the intake manifold, just as it is in a petrol engine. The exhaust gas then flows into the engine. An exhaust flap is fitted at the front in the exhaust pipe to control the system. This flap controls a slight excess pressure in the particulate filter, flushing the exhaust gas recirculation cooler in the process to ensure there is no build-up of soot. We will now look at the cooling system. We call it a cooling system, but is thermal management a better description? It is an Intelligent Thermal Management System, or ITM for short. This system delivers the performance required of a modern thermal management system. It holds stationary and flowing coolant in several sections of the coolant circuit. The graphic looks quite confusing at first glance. Would you say that the switchable coolant pump plays a key role in this system? This switchable coolant pump is new to this engine. It does not work using a vacuum, as it does in the eight-cylinder engine, nor does it use a ball valve, as in the six-cylinder engine. In fact, it works hydraulically using coolant. Where is the pump installed? The coolant pump is installed here, driven by the back of the tooth belt. Here is the switch valve for switching the coolant pump. Let's take a closer look at these parts using this exploded diagram, which is also available in the self-study program. You can see the vein, which ensures that the coolant is circulated. You can also see an axial piston pump and a control sleeve. This sleeve slides over the vein hydraulically when the valve is energized. The vein has a special feature. The front of it transports the coolant while there is a swash plate on the back. So it does not run smoothly, but instead wobbles. The axial piston pump sucks in the coolant and pumps it through the ducts to the solenoid valve. If the solenoid valve is energized, it will close the return to the cooling system. The valve then pumps the coolant inside the engine via the annular piston. The control sleeve then slides over the vein. If the solenoid valve is not energized, the coolant flows back into the coolant circuit. This happens providing that the engine is running. Let's take another look at the graphic showing the heating circuit. Various engine conditions are depicted. Let's begin with a cold start. The engine is cold. Here you can see the micro-circuit or heating circuit in the cooling system. It only operates via the coolant support pump, which in this case is an electric pump. The coolant flows through the cylinder head, which has a special feature. The cylinder head is divided into a bottom and top half. Most of the time the coolant flows through the bottom half. This half runs directly above the combustion chamber plate. 
Under this plate is where the combustion takes place in the valves. The water fed over this plate therefore heats up very quickly. It also runs via the exhaust gas recirculation cooler, where the coolant continues to be heated up. From there, the coolant flows to the auxiliary heater, if fitted, and then to the heat exchanger in the heating system. So heat is transported relatively quickly? Yes, and it's transported quickly via the auxiliary coolant pump. The engine is still cold, but it is now charged. The engine needs coolant when it is under load due to the combustion temperatures. The mechanical coolant pump is now activated. The control sleeve slides back because the solenoid valve is no longer energized. The coolant is circulated in this way. It is guided through the cylinder head and the exhaust gas recirculation cooler and then flows to the heat exchanger in the heating system. The electric pump, which was previously operating at full capacity, is retracted to approximately 30%. The pull of the mechanical pump is now greater than that of the electric pump. The water now flows to the right. The water is sucked into the circuit by the mechanical pump. The background to this is that the heat exchanger for cooling the oil and the throttle valve module are to be activated. The loaded components are therefore cooled while they're charged. We've not considered normal operation. The engine is at operating temperature. We have a coolant temperature of approximately 90 degrees. The mechanical water pump is now working at full capacity, and the electrical auxiliary coolant pump is also operating. When the thermostat is open, the coolant is guided through the main water cooler. It flows into the engine block and the circuit is closed, except for one detail. The charge air cooler is missing. This is self-supporting and only supplied with coolant via the expansion tank. If coolant is missing somewhere, it is drawn from there. It ventilates itself via the expansion tank, in which the charge air coolant circuit is a closed circuit. We have another graphic to look at. We can see the charge air cooler, which is located in the intake manifold. The hot air from the turbocharger is guided through this cooler and flows into the engine. The water heated through this process also needs to be cooled. The coolant circuit is a closed circuit on account of the lower temperatures. There are two temperature sensors, one sensor at the front for the intake of charge air and one at the rear for the outflow of charge air. This is how you know how quickly the electric pump must circulate the water. The charge air cools in the same way. At the top, we can see that the charge air cooler has coolant in it. At the bottom, there is the auxiliary pump that cools the charge air. And there is an additional charge air cooler that is cooled by water and air. The coolant is then pumped up again. Depending on the temperature, the pump is activated to a lesser or greater extent. That was a lot of information. What is the number of the SSP? It is SSP 608. We have one more piece of information regarding the coolant. With silicate is written on the expansion tank. In modern engines, G13 coolant is the one that is topped up, and this coolant contains a silicate. This is our additional safety barrier that protects against corrosion. 
and, in particular, protects all aluminium conducting components in the coolant circuit, i.e. the cooler and sensors. The silicate protects probes on the sensor. This protective measure means that no layer can form and that precise measurements can always be taken. That's why there is silicate in this tank. It does not need changing. This silicate is simply a reserve stock in case only water is added with no coolant. So it's a form of prevention. Exactly. It's an additional protective measure. It protects aluminium conducting components against corrosion. A second program will look at the EU6 standard. That's it for today. Until next time, goodbye. Tschüss.